This is Brandon Bussey, and you're listening to the Providence Hockey Report. Welcome to the Providence Hockey Report podcast, the ultimate destination for everything you need to know about the American Hockey League Providence Bruins. Join Bruins hockey writers Mark Allred and Kenny Kaminsky as these line mates get together each week to break down the latest games, discuss player performances, and keep you updated on all the news from the top minor pro affiliate of the NHL Boston Bruins. We appreciate the download, and without further ado, here's Mark and Kenny. Enjoy the show. All right, what is up, Bruins fans? Uh, welcome to the Providence Hockey Report podcast. Uh, in partnership with the Cycle and Sports Podcast Network and the Black and Gold Production Sports Media Company. Uh, this is Season 1, Episode 3. I'm your host, Mark Allred. That gentleman over there is Kenny Kaminsky. Kenny, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. I'm excited to get to get after it once again. I thought Episode 1 was a pretty big success, so... Yeah, a little little nerve wracking because I'm not really like made for hosting shows. I'm more like, the background guy. Ask me a question and I'll do my best to give you the best answer. But driving an agenda is always just a little tough for me. So, and you know, saying that, if anybody does want to become the main host here, all three of us can talk Providence Bruins hockey. So that would be exciting to have somebody else in the fold. Um, I do want to mention because I'm a nervous wreck, and as I mentioned before. Uh, but last week, I forgot to mention something very important um, that the uh, Providence Hockey Report and our Black and Gold Production Sports Media Company uh, does have an agreement uh, partnership uh, with Flow Hockey. So we do have permission to use any of Flow Hockey's audio and video for this production. So um, as many of you seen, um, uh, some really decent video of, of some goals last week. There was only two of them, but we did show you those. But this week we've amped up our our um, you know our, our efforts to make those videos a little bit longer and a little bit more quality. So Kenny's done a fantastic job doing that, um, and we're excited to you know to not only talk about the games but also bring the aspect of the eye test to our you know our, our listeners who can hear the audio of the goal call, but also if you're on, you know, YouTube, please subscribe, obviously hit the, hit the uh, thumbs up and, and uh, you know, comment. Um, we love, we love interacting with everybody, but you know, it, we, we have that ability to show uh, Bruins fans what they want to see. And I think that's a, I think that's a big help um, to gain more um, viewers and, you know, to get us a little higher ranking in, in, in the hockey world, because, to be honest, Kenny, I, I honestly don't know. Like, I think you mentioned last week that there's really not many Providence hockey podcasts. Yeah, and I think that we could do something really special and unique here. I mean, it, it's difficult. The, the AHL schedule is so grueling, and especially as we get towards Christmas time, like, everybody's busy. So the fact that we can show these clips and you can get all the information that you need for this coming week in, you know, 45 minutes in an hour, I think it's just something special. And it's something so niche, like it's something that you don't see all the time. So the fact that we can keep it at 45 minutes in an hour, just take take a little bit of, of your day and you can get information on all prospects for, for Providence and Boston. I think it's it's unique and I'm excited to be a part of it. Yeah, obviously come here, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio. And like I said, please subscribe to uh, the YouTube channel. Um but also check out Flow Hockey. If you're a diehard hockey fan, I'm telling you, for $29.99, there's a ton of hockey to watch. The AHL, the ECHL, the PSI, the USHL. There's so much hockey. It's it's crazy. It's definitely well worth it. So we highly recommend that you um, get a subscription over there. Or if I'm not mistaken, they do offer other packages where you don't have to buy the whole uh, you know thing. I think it's for... Uh, Twelve ninety nine. You can get the American Hockey League only. So, uh, but it's definitely worth it. And, and they're our partners, and we definitely have to shout them out because we we thank them for for uh, our interactions before because it was a tight window. AHL TV. We had a uh, we had a, a great relationship with for several years, and AHL TV kind of went away, and Flow Hockey came in and took over. So we had to create a new relationship with this with this streaming service. 
And those guys over there were fantastic with the back and forth. So uh, we did come to an agreement on, you know, on, on some things that we're allowed to do. And, and we talked about some things that we're not allowed to do. So uh, I hope that, you know, what we can provide you is good enough for what you need to know about the Providence Bruins and, and how they're doing. So um, why don't we get started with some, uh, some prospect talk. And this is something that I'd like to do every week. Uh, if Kenny, obviously, if you're up, if you're up for it, um, but maybe, maybe, maybe not start with it. But let's maybe next week we'll uh, we'll we'll finish the show with it before we get to questions. But uh, let's do uh, Kenny's prospect report. So Kenny, what do we got for it? Yeah, it was a big week for Bruins prospects, and I talked about it last week. How I, I really wasn't happy with the way that the that the rankings were for the Bruins prospects, how low they were. And uh, seems like I was right because the the prospects in the NCAA are doing a fantastic job so far this season. To kick it off, Ryan Walsh of the uh, Cornell Big Red, they kicked off their season. Uh, the Ivy League schedule is a little bit weird because they ha- they start later, but he had one goal and two assists as Cornell swept number six, North Dakota. And he was ECAC Player of the Week, so congrats to him. Ty Gallagher, who we talked about last week, Colorado College, they defeated their rivals, Air Force, six to one. He had a goal and an assist. And now he has six points in six games, surpassing his five-point total in 37 games last season at Boston University. So the change of scenery definitely doing wonders for him. Um, me and me and Dave Collins, uh, we love talking about this guy on Twitter. Dan's Lock Mellis versus AIC pulled out the win. One goal, one assist, scored his first goal of the season. He has nine points in eight games this season. He's carrying UMass like he carried uh, his country, Lavia 2A. Uh, what is it? Olympics, Olympic yep. qualifying spot. Again, we talked about this guy last week, Elliot Gronwald. We talked about how his role was a little bit limited because of how good the Bobcats defense is, but he had an elevated role against Holy Cross where he scored one goal and one assist, scored his first collegiate goal. So congrats to him. And of course, everybody wants to know about our 25th pick this season, Dean Letourneau versus St. Cloud State. He scored his first official college point. BC uh, swept St. Cloud State, and the reason I say first official is because he did score a goal against the United States National Team Development Program, but obviously that was an exhibition. It does not count. And to cap it off, Philip Svediback showing why the uh, the Bruins' goaltending pipeline is still alive and well as he got his 35th win and moved up to third all-time in Providence College win. So congrats to him, and that's all I got for prospect update for this week. Nice. Nice. Thank you very much, Kenny. I appreciate that. Um, I like that. It's a, you know, it's a a little insight on what's going on, you know, below the American hockey league and the ECHL and so on. And the guys that are, that are obviously probably going to make their way into Providence sooner or later. I could honestly say that uh, Don Slus Mellish is probably going to leave school after this year and sign an ATO, possibly get his first few pro games. Um, uh, with Providence. And then um, shortly after I could see him signing that entry level contract. So uh, yeah, I, I really like Don's and I, I like the way he plays. So uh, he'll be exciting to have in the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the minor pro pipeline per se. I don't think he's going to turn, you know, NHL pro anytime soon. I think he's, uh, you know, how those euros, they, Good players, you know, but they just need to adjust that smaller ice. Everything comes quicker to you, yeah. um, you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, again, thank you for that um, update. Let's move on to some uh, Providence Bruins news that um, surrounding the team over the last week. Um, let's start. With, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate news to start with. Um, injuries. Um, Fabian Lysel. Uh, did not play the last two games up in Laval, Quebec. Um, seemingly an upper body injury. That's what we're trying to, w- we're thinking right now. Um, and we do have a little bit of a video that uh, Kenny put together to kind of put to show what we think. Not exactly what happened, but what we think could have happened because it wasn't highlighted in any game or anything like that. So Kenny went and did his um, his uh, due diligence uh, to find a moment in the game versus Belleville that might have knocked him out. So uh, before we show you the video, uh, what are your thoughts on this injury? I mean, this kid can't t- catch a break. Yeah, it's it's certainly unfortunate, but I'm hoping that maybe this this break 
maybe he can come back and start producing more. I mean, seven games, two points is not where he wants to be, but uh, I felt like in the games against Laval, they were, they were sorely missing his, his uh, speed that he has. And again, when you watch this video, it's, it's tough because the AHL with injuries isn't as formal as the NHL. Usually when somebody gets an injury in the NHL, you're going to know almost immediately what the injury is. And when you look at this injury, it's an awkward fall. So it could be anything from a foot injury to a head injury. When you watch this clip, I slowed it down. It looks like the Belleville players hip kind of pushes Lizelle's shoulder, who is who, you know, he already injured that shoulder last season in a game against Charlotte. It looks like he kind of slammed that into a wall, but at the end of the day, it's, it's anybody's guess really. And the last thing I just wanted to say, we're going to talk about it in a second as well. Lizelle and Sweezy were both, at practice yesterday, but they did not do any drills. They left the ice per Mark Diver. So now we can roll the clip. Yeah, let's roll that clip of uh, the Fabian Lysel. And uh, um, let's hear your thoughts in the comments about if you think this is the injury and this is the one that knocked him out. Brown tries to muscle a backhander up the wall. It stayed in thanks to Donovan Sobrango pinching. And then a lead feed for Ollie Lexell, and he can't find it. It's taken down by Jorian Donovan. Another thing that really bothered me about this game last Wednesday night was the Belleville Senators play-by-play, uh, -play, play, not crapping on those guys. Everybody makes mistakes. Trust me, I make tons of them. But that was not the Philadelphia Flyers prospect, Ole Lysel. That was uh, Fabian Lysel. That guy had a time on Wednesday screwing a ton of stuff up. Thoughts? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, even uh, the 31-year-old Brett Harrison – and I and I wrote it in my in my notes for later to touch on how that day I was in uh, I was watching the game in Bridgeport and then the first two goals came in like the the first minute for Wilkesbury so I was like okay I'm gonna be that I'm gonna be that guy and put my AirPods in and I felt like am I hearing this right am I like I can't even believe it until I saw somebody say something on Twitter but it was just funny how this guy was like late in the game he was like oh that's not Ollie Lixell that's Fabian Lysel and then he went immediately back to calling him Lixell so. Yeah. whatever but uh, like i said it, it, it's it's difficult it's difficult so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna talk shit too much all right and uh here's the billy sweezy injury and but this one was verse uh laval over the weekend um and it's a little bit of a reverse hit where i kind of think that he he basically maybe got the wind knocked out of him but that also looked to me the way he got up was a little bit concussion like but I, didn't, I don't want to speculate. I'm not a doctor or anything like that, but let's have a look and see at the Billy Sweezy injury against Laval. Deux options de rappel chez le Canadien. Son troisième du match, marqué par le numéro 6. Rocket goal, his third of the game, scored by number 10, Joshua. Oh, quel bizarre d'échec de Luke Tuck à l'endroit de Billy Sweezy. Et là, ça va brasser dans le coin. Et Tuck ne reculera pas. Ce qui l'a sonné, Billy Sweezy. And right at the end of that, that clip is where Billy Sweezy kind of like was looking down at the ice and then kind of like really went flat on the ice. Like he was trying to catch his breath. And uh, apologies on the French. Uh, version of this video um as of right now flow hockey tremendous uh service as we we previously talked about but um you know they're new and it's in, in the inner workings of the american hockey league so i would say within a year this is going to get much better and they're going to start having an american voice up when they go to canada and they you know when they play laval and uh you know they they predominantly predominantly speak french up there um but I think that's going to be worked out. But a, a couple of these clips that are coming up are going to be in French. So we apologize for that because it's the only feed that we could use. Um, yeah, so uh, the final thing on the on the Bruins news, um, the Boston Bruins placed Max Jones, a forward, uh, on waivers yesterday. That was per Elliot Friedman at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And at 2 o'clock this afternoon, or right around there, the Boston Bruins did mention that they put him on waivers for the purpose of assignment in Providence. So um, what are your thoughts on uh, the Max Jones uh, um, waiving and clearing? And what could he do what, or what can he bring to the Providence Bruins organization? 
Yeah, as a Providence fan, I'm not like too thrilled about it because I want to see guys like Kuntar and Duran and Abate kind of, you know, get thrusted into a bigger role. But when guys are coming down, it, it's difficult to do it. But uh, as a Boston Bruins fan, this is something that needed to be done. I mean, he he looked a step behind, and it's it's unfortunate because I think nobody really expected Max Jones to be in Providence this season, but I think Cole Kepke really pushed him out of that job. And I would love to talk to an AHL coach, uh, you know, Ryan Mujanel, anybody really about this, because everybody always wants to ask about how, how do you adjust to the NHL team taking your best players whenever they want? But it's also, how do you deal with a struggling player in the NHL who, who might not want to be in Providence? I'm sure Max Jones didn't, you know, foresee being in Providence to, you know, a few weeks into the season like how a player like him who's struggling, how do you deal with that now that he's coming down? Do you put him in a position like on the first line just to, you know, try to get the game going? I don't know. It was some, it's just a question that, that I would have. But I, I think that Max Jones is, is built for this Providence Bruins team. I think he's one of those hard-hitting wingers who could score. I just I don't know if he's going to get called up. He hasn't played a, an AHL game since the 1920 season, so I'm sure he's not too thrilled, but I'm sure he's going to take it like a professional and, and go down and play some games and, you know, try to earn his way back up. Yeah, much like what Riley Tufty did. You know, he got waived, saved a little bit of cap space for the Boston Bruins. week later, they signed um, um, uh, Tyler Johnson. But Tufty went down and, and immediately showed impacts in the game. Um, I think if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, he scored in his first game. So, um, you know, I don't think he's sulking. I think he wants to work hard to get back up to the NHL level and prove that he can, he could possibly play, you know, I'm not going to shit on the guy because it was tough to watch him at the NHL level because he was, you know, creating a lot of penalties and putting the Bruins in a really bad situation. But I mean, maybe at the AHL level, that's something to be, you know, learned a little bit more, but also prove that you can still play, a good style of game at the America at the NHL level at the AHL level, um, you know, to, to prove that you can still do it. So, um, but anyway, as I babble on, <laughs> uh, that's it for, um, P Bruins news right now. There were no transactions, uh, this past week, everybody stayed the same. Nobody came up from Maine or down to the ECHL level. So, uh, pretty easy week on that segment, right? Yeah, thank God we could we could use an easy easy segment here to to cut us down a little bit. Absolutely. All right, let's head over to the uh, game recaps. Uh, there were three games last week. Um, the Providence Bruins were in Belleville, Ontario, at the CAA Arena on October thirtieth, and that was a Wednesday night. If I didn't say that, um, this was a game one of a three game road trip. Um, and Providence uh, got on the board real quick. Um, it was Joey Abate. He scored his first at the 11.55 mark of the first period, assisted by Mark McLaughlin and Trevor Kuntar, uh, even strength goal. And the Joey Abate goal, assisted by McLaughlin and Kuntar, can be seen here, courtesy of Flow Hockey. Bruins up the ice with McLaughlin, dropped it off. Abadi shoots and scores, and a low wrist shot from Joey Abadi is going to get. That was a, a really good play by Joey, uh, and and what a rifled shot! What do you think on that goal? I think it's good. I uh, we were talking about him last week. You know, I I wanted to see him step up a little bit, and I like those type of shots. I like getting the shots on net, especially with a team that's struggling to score goals. It was a beautiful shot placed right over the the pad of Marilinen, but. More importantly, the way that he got himself open in, in a play that was kind of funky, he kind of set himself right behind McLaughlin, and it was a beautiful shot. And I'm happy that he finally got on the board. Yeah, yeah, he's and Joey's one of those players that that does it all. He can be a pest. Uh, he does have some speed. He does have some skill. Uh, you know, but he's he's more or less going to be that that third or fourth line, mostly a fourth liner and and a rotationary player too because he's a you know, he's a an American Hockey League vet and so on. And uh, I thought for sure last year he could have gotten a game or two at the NHL level, but remains. Um, 
So uh, later on in that first period at the 1436 mark, Riley Tufty, as we mentioned, scored his first from Ian Mitchell and Vinny Letary on the power play. And let's see that video highlight, courtesy of Flo Hawk. to the outside in the corner there was Patrick Brown. They'll work it up top, a low shot, stopped it on the rebound, bunted in on the doorstep by Riley Tufty. The big man right up, right, right near the crease, um, you know, get, catching a rebound and, and blasting that rebound right in. Um, so uh, thoughts on the Riley Tufty goal assisted by Mitchell and Letary on the man advantage. Yeah, I was really excited to see this. I talked about it last week, how I felt like the power play just needed to see one go in and Riley Tufty doing what I expect him to do, stand out in front of the net, be a big body and, and put one home. And unfortunately I was, I was wrong. They, they need more than one to go in for the power play to start producing, but uh, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and unfortunately Belleville uh, would uh, enter the second period and pretty much own it. Um, and both teams, well, Belleville scored two goals in the second period at the 235 mark by Davies and the 1919 mark by Reinhardt. Uh, and those both were power play goals. Uh, no scoring in the third period. And we go to a shootout where Boston Bruins prospect Brett Harrison. You Canadians on this Bruins team. He'll pick it up and weave back and forth inside the dots. He's out to the right circle and sneaks it between the legs of Levy Marilainen. Crafty move there by the Bruins prospect, uh, Brett Harrison. Um, and uh, Brett Harrison ends up being the first star of the game on that. And, and, and I got to shout out Mark Diver because he found it funny as well. Because I was thinking it, he tweeted it or posted it on X. Um, you know, Brett Harrison gets the first star of the game, but the only thing he basically did was score the shoot out because uh, uh, he was pretty much an, a non-factor in that game. I mean, I'm not saying he, was, he wasn't he was participating and wasn't fully in it, but it, you really didn't notice him much. So that's why we're we're saying that. So uh, thoughts on the, uh, the Harrison goal and uh, ultimately the shootout win over Belleville for the first game of this uh, three game road trip. I don't even think it's so much that I'm laughing that he just he didn't really do much all game. I'm laughing because Mikey DiPietro stops 35 of 37 and blank slates the uh, the Belleville Senators in a shootout and he doesn't get first star. That's criminal. That's absolutely yeah. criminal. Somebody owes that guy a dinner at this point. But uh, it was a good game and I like seeing uh, a guy like Brett Harrison score a goal like that. I mean, he has so much skill and it's been. It's been tough to to see it so far this season, but we saw it in the prospects challenge as well. Like once he gets going, he really gets going, and he's hard to stop, especially for these defensemen. But like I said, Mikey DiPietro, thirty five stops on thirty seven shots, and uh, we're gonna go back to the broadcaster. I'm so mad that this happened because I wanted to post Mikey DiPietro made a really nice glove save in the shootout, and and the uh, the broadcaster screamed that it went off the post. So I was like, oh, I can't post this. I can't I can't <laughs> post that to Twitter. But other than that. It's a uh, it's a game they found a way to win, and that's important for any team because you're never you're never gonna you know all season you're not gonna be the best team game in and game out, but figuring out ways to win is is huge. So I like seeing that they're facing adversity and they're conquering that adversity uh, here in Belleville to start the road trip. Yeah, and we said this last week that you know this road trip was important for their confidence moving forward. Um, you know these more or less these these trips are by bus. So there's a lot of time where, where players get to hang out and so on. And, you know, it's, it's good commodity. Um, and, and you learn from each other from trips like this. And I just really hope that, um, you know, playing in Belleville on Wednesday night and going to, we'll talk about the two games in Laval, um, you know, would be a, kind of a, a, a regular season timeline for them to turn things around for the better and kind of get a little higher in the, uh, in the American Hockey League Atlantic Division, where it, it, it is tough hockey. You know, there's a lot of teams ahead of the Providence Bruins right now, including Charlotte and Hershey, that are just being, um, you know, powerhouse teams and really getting off to a really good start. So, all right. So this game ends in Belleville with a 3-2 to two shootout win for the Providence Bruins. Uh, uh, Belleville outshot Providence 37-25. to 25. Um, 
one thing I do want to mention is, is yes, DPH was very good, only given up to. We'll talk about him later on. But the attendance in Belleville, I've watched a lot of Belleville games, and I, I noticed that they, 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 they have a good showing, their fandom. But on a Wednesday night, 1965 in the building on a Wednesday night was not good scenery. Uh, if this game was on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday afternoon, that place would have been a little more packed, I believe. But um, I just I cannot stand AHL games on a Wednesday night. It's so tough. So tough. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, I was in Bridgeport that night and, and Bridgeport's attendance has been, you know, on the on the decline the last few years, especially with the the play that they've been producing on the ice. It's just it was so tough, especially being in Connecticut. I know Hartford also played that night. You know, uh, Yankees were playing that night as well. So the attendance absolutely tanked. I was sitting there. There was no lines for anything. I loved it. I had a great time. But I was also the guy with his AirPods and watching another game, which actually for that game, it wasn't the weirdest thing because a lot of people were doing that. They probably went to the, the game for their kids and then they had their, the Yankees game on the phone. So, you know, at least I wasn't too out of place. True. All right, moving on to Friday night's game, November 1st, 2024, at the Place Bell in Laval, Quebec. Uh, the Providence Bruins and Laval Rocket did uh, battle. Now, here is an arena on a Friday night that really showed um, these guys pretty much packed uh, 9,235 on this night. Um, this The Providence Bruins are an American Hockey League affiliate of the Boston Bruins. The Laval Rocket are the American Hockey League affiliate of the Montreal Canadiens. So there is a, a little bit of a rivalry here between organizations, NHL organizations. But, you know, Laval being in the North Division and um, Providence in the Atlantic, it's, it's criminal that these teams don't face each other. But I'll tell you, I don't want to see much yeah, more of yeah. Laval at all, uh, even in the playoffs coming up, because they are a really good team this year. Um, coming out hard, uh, you know, getting their points early and climbing the North uh, North Division. But um, in this game, uh, Laval gets on the board at the 7.33 mark um, of the first period. Uh, Davidson scores his fourth from uh, Logan Mayhew and, and Roy on the power play. Uh, Mayhew has just been absolutely <laughs> killing Providence this year. And this is why I don't want to play them anymore because this, this defenseman is just, he is a defenseman, right? Logan. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah, well, I, just, I said this last week too. I was like, I yeah. see some of these guys skating. I'm like, I got to look down at, at my sheet and see, are these guys really defensemen? Yeah. Logan Mayu defenseman. Holy, is he good? Yeah. He's got like 80 points against Providence in three games as a joke, obviously. Uh, <laughs> Well, he's actually pretty close. I think he has nine in, in, in three right, games. He's right. actually unbelievable. Yeah. He, he, um, you know, for, for all the crappy things that he did in previous, um, he is a good player. I will say that. I, you know, the the legal stuff and stuff like that, and one of, one of the reasons why he didn't get drafted or, or, or got drafted, but, you know, there was a little bit of a mix-up, you know, because of what he did. Um, I will never, you know, agree with and condone, but, um, yeah, but he's a good player regardless. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. Um, Georgie Merkulov, uh, gets the Providence Bruins on the, on the board in the second period. He was the only goal scorer in the middle frame at the 1648 mark. He scores his first of the year. Great to see Georgie get on the board. Uh, and that was an unassisted goal. And, um, that, Goal can be seen here, courtesy of the great folks at Flow Hockey. Okay, ici, uh, Villal qui vient appliquer de la pression sur le gardien Hughes. Il a bien réagi pour remettre à Waterspoon. Farrell est débordé, il a perdu, il a tiré le but. Georgi Berkulov. A uh, really good release there from Georgi Mikulov. We've always, we've always known that he's had really good hands, good release, good speed, and so on. Um, but it's, it's his two-way game that he constantly needs to work on. Um, so, uh, and to finish up talking about this game in the third period, Laval gets on the board for the two to one lead at the one Oh three mark. Owen Beck, uh, scores his second. Uh, and that was a shorthanded goal and to make it worse. So, uh, the power play and the penalty kill did not do good at all uh, on this night for the Providence Bruins. 
Um, and even though the Providence Bruins weren't in the box a lot, they made uh, some stupid penalties that cost them. You know, it was just ridiculous. So, uh, Mike DiPietro got the start in goal, stopped 14 of 16. Um, and he, yeah, he got in 15, 58 minutes and 30 seconds. Um, and uh, Providence actually outshot Laval 28 to 16 in this game. Um, so thoughts from you, Kenny, on, on this game and, and obviously the uh, Mercury Love goal. Yeah, it's uh it's a tough loss to stomach. It, it's like we felt like we had uh or I felt like Providence had, you know, momentum for most of this game and it's an unfortunate turnover on the power play that resulted in that final goal. But I was happy to see Mer uh Merkelov score his his first of the season, something that I even talked about last week during the preseason he seemed really hesitant to to shoot. So he look even though he scored it was it was relieving to see that he was also taking a ton of shots this game. And even if they weren't, you know, high quality chances, still getting the puck on net for somebody with such a good release is just huge. And then again, Mikey DPHO doing what he does best. It's un it's unfortunate that another good performance gets wasted. But um, you know, even though it was a loss, I had I had really high hopes going into the next game. Yeah, yeah, me too. And let's talk about that next game. And that is on Saturday night, November 2nd, 2024, at Place Bell again. This time, 10,033 fans um, were jam-packed in the building. This was an afternoon game, which was good. Um, so, but there was a lot. This was a this was a game that you knew that there was a deep rivalry, you know, in the past with the Boston Bruins and the Montreal Canadiens because this was the type of hockey that you would see if those two teams were actually playing on this night, uh, on this afternoon. So um, crazy amounts of penalties. I don't even want to get into it, but there was a lot of goal scoring. Um, Providence ended up losing six to three. Uh, which is unfortunate, uh, and they out they outshot Laval, one of the better teams in the league, for the second straight game in as many nights, thirty three to twenty two. So, not getting their chances, but they're not giving really quality shots either, in my opinion. Um, Providence got on the board first in the first period at the fourteen. I'm sorry, the eleven forty two mark of the uh, opening frame. Riley Tufty scores his. Second goal of the season, assisted by uh, defenseman Frederick Brunet and forward and the team captain Patrick Brown. And that goal can be seen here, courtesy of Flo Hawk. Ah, Gignac est là, à la mise au jeu. Devant Brown qui va l'emporter. La remise à la ligne bleue pour Brunet. Son tir et le but! Ben, c'est un tir en partie raté, dévié. Ça semblait changer de direction. Another goal from Riley Tufty in that area. He seems to be really hot around the crease. Uh, and this is where he's, you know, he's, what I was saying, but he's not like playing down like he's he's sulking or anything like that. He just seems like he's playing to a, a pace where he knows that there's a chance to get back up. There probably was some words from Don Sweeney and the coaching staff to say, go down, work on your game. We'll real evaluate you to see if you can come back up and, and contribute. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with like throwing a, a bone out to a to a player like that to, to you know to get him motivated and so on to try to get back to the NHL level. Uh, so, what are your thoughts on the Tufty goal? Yeah, like you just said, I think it's the same with Tufty and Jones. They're both Bruins molded players. They play a Boston Bruins style game, and even though it's not clicking early in the season, it doesn't mean that they they're not gonna necessarily be called up by the end of the season you never know what happens with injuries and stuff like that but even further than that I like seeing Freddie Brunet get shots on net that's huge but you know when you're struggling to score goals these are the type of goals that you need these are the types of shifts that you need beautiful win off the face off it was probably set up that way it was a nice pass from Brown to Brunet and then a, a shot that you know it just got deflected in when you're playing a hot goalie and you're not scoring goals like like i said these are the types of goals and chances you need to create yeah well said um laval would uh would get to a two to one lead after scoring two goals um uh, one of them 
at the 1910 mark uh, from a former Providence forward last year, Vincent Arsenault, who scores his first. And uh, Logan Mayu in the second period uh, gets uh, Laval to two to one. He scores his third of the year. Um, and in the second period, Providence gets on the board to tie the game at two at the 10 20 mark, scored by Tyler Pitlick, who's still on a PTO with the Providence Bruins. He scores a second from Michael Callahan and Joey Abate, even strengths. And let's see that goal. Alain Boucher vient d'obtenir une super bonne occasion. Contre-attaque les Bruins. Pitlick coupe devant le tir et le but. Connor Hughes est battu alors que Pitlick. So Tyler Pitlick coming down the wing, uh, crashing the net and making things happen. Uh, he's been a, a pleasant surprise so far. A little bit of an up and down, but you know he's been showing really well. Uh, and that video, uh, I want to say, was brought to you by Flow Hockey. The amazing folks, folks at Flow Hockey. Uh, go check them out at flowhockey.com and get yourself a subscription. Uh, so thoughts on the Pitlick goal, my friend? Yeah, that's huge. I love seeing this out of a veteran, just muscling it to the front of the net and just putting one home. It's another goal that, you know, you like to see from a team that's struggling to score. He just outwilled the Laval defense, who are very skilled and very talented, as we've as we've said they're a, they're a fast team. Their defense is really good on their edges. But like I said, a veteran just pushing his way to the front and scoring a goal like that is just huge. And even though the game was tied, I felt like Providence had a really good hold on the game and the momentum, which unfortunately, as we'll see in a, in a few seconds here, kind of slipped away. Yeah. You know, and then um, uh, Josh Raw, Wa, I think that's his name. Uh, pretty much took over the second period after Pitlick scored the goal. Uh, gets his team up to a 4-2 to two lead with two goals in the middle frame. Um, one of them was on the power play. Um, but, it, you know, it's kind of weird how this whole game comes out. It's like Providence scores, Laval scores too. Providence scores, Laval scores too. And this next goal... Uh, courtesy of Vinny Letary, who has been red hot, scores his fifth at the 16-10 mark uh, in the third period uh, to get the Providence Bruins a little closer uh, to the four goals that the Laval Rocket have at home. That goal was scored by Jordan Osterley and Georgia Mikulov and can be seen here on Flow Hockey. Thierry, Mikulov at Osterley, qui ramène transversal à Letiéry. Lettieri, du haut des cercles, sont tirés le but! Ben là, le sentait venir, ce but-là. Oui. Vini Lettieri. And uh, that would be the last goal of the Providence in this game and the weekend, which we actually thought would be a little bit better. But Laval's a really good team. But uh, anyway, Laval scores two goals in the third. One of them was an empty net goal. Uh, Logan Mayu, like we were talking about, so glad that he's not going to be playing uh, the Providence Bruins anymore because I think these games are over with. But he had a he had one one goal, one two, three assists, one goal and three assists in this game. So it's absolutely criminal what this guy was doing to the freaking Providence Bruins this weekend and this and to start the season because. For the uh, the first game of the year at at Providence, the Amica Mutual Pavilion, this guy was just going off on on this Providence Bruins team. Yeah, and uh, in in that game he had four points. So two two games he had four points against Providence, which sucks. But uh, the Letary goal, it's it's something I have mixed emotions about. Obviously, I like seeing Vinny Letary score. I like seeing the goals being scored, and I like seeing that. Osterley, Merkulov, and Letary were all contributing to that goal. I mean, that's what you want when you're in crunch time. You want your top players to start, you know, locking in and making plays, which is great. But I want to see more from other players. I want to see other players step up. Vinny Letary with his wrist shot clearly can score. Georgi Merkulov with his passing and his vision clearly can get assists. Same with Osterley. So, I mean, Vinny Letary scored, unfortunately, like two seconds later, they end up giving up like the worst chance I've ever seen. And they end up putting it in the back of the net and basically, uh, you know, winning the game there. But yeah, I mean, mixed emotions on that goal. But Vinny Letary, like you said, red hot, as we'll talk about later. 
Yeah. Uh, Brandy Bussey got the start in this one, taking the loss. I uh, gave up five goals and um, uh, stopped 16. So his uh, season continues to be a little rough one. And we'll talk about that in the next one. Um, anything you want to talk about to wrap up the uh, game recaps? Yeah, I guess uh, if I was going to leave you guys with this, we talked about this before we got on the uh, the podcast today that, you know, this was a series that we thought Providence could have very well went 3-0. And the way that they played after that first game, it could have very well been 3-0. But just the way that the games have been falling, like we were one, one goal away from this being an 0-3 trip. But I think that this, that this trip hopefully – lit a fire under their ass and finally they could start scoring goals. But um, I would say that this trip was a unsuccessful one and I'm sure they they're thinking the same thing in Providence. Yeah. It's unfortunate. Uh, we were hoping for the best, like a, a turnaround, but it's, it's still early in the season, um, you know, to get acclimated to each other a little more and so on. And I think that I'm always going to say this folks, and I know it's repetitive, but, I think by the mid to end of the year, they this team really kicks it up and, and it really starts to take notice of where they're going to stand and if they're going to make the playoffs or not. So, uh, but anyway, if you're going to make the playoffs, you got to have strong goaltending. And we're going to talk about the Providence Bruins goaltenders coming up. I could be because one is going up the stock and the other one is going down. Um, and we're not poo pooing on any of the efforts of, of, any goaltender, um, but we do need to talk about it. Um, and we'll start off with why don't we use our only question this week? And if you do have questions on, on Twitter or X or or you can just send us a message, but please use the hashtag Ask B and G Ask P H R hashtag Ask P H R because that way we can keep track of them all um, because we do get a lot, and I just. Uh, it's so hard to keep track of. So, um, and it's, it's from our, our company colleague, um, Tom Caliuti has Michael DiPietro been the better goalie thus far. Hashtag ask PHR. So why don't we start off with Michael DiPietro and how he's been playing thus far. Uh, why don't we go with you, Kenny? Yeah, DPH has been very good so far. Honestly, I'm shocked that he isn't 5 0 0 right now. A few unfortunate losses where he's given up two goals or less. He's 3 2 0 this season, 1.59 goals against average, which is very, very good, and a 940 save percentage. I talked about it last week, and we talked about it on the uh, the Black and Gold podcast during the, uh, the preseason where. Mikey DiPietro is one of those smaller goalies, but he's not presenting himself as small. He, You would have no idea if you're watching the game that he's 6'1", opposed to somebody who's 6'6", because he's just presenting himself so big to the shots. And I talked about it last week about, you know, I didn't know how he's going to perform after the preseason where he was a little bit shaky. But um, his first game against Bridgeport, he gave up a soft goal to Pierre Engvall to start the season, and I wanted to see how he's going to react to that. And uh, he played a fantastic rest of the game, and he's just had a really good season. And I think that it's translated, right? So he's he's sometimes he does give up weak goals, but he's he's always in it, and he's always having uh, a good game. I feel like, and he is currently ranked top ten statistically in the AHL. And honestly, thank God that he's playing as well as. Uh, as he is, because this could be a really, really ugly start if he ha if he's not playing the way he's playing. Yeah. Hey, let's check out this uh, really quick breakaway um, save that he made in Laval over the weekend on Friday night. En territoire du Rocket, c'est Mayou qui intervient derrière le but. Vers Trudeau qui ne parvient pas à reprendre. Et attention, contre-attaque. Gignac s'amène. Il va envoyer vers Jacka. Il est seul. Jacka, il le tire. L'arrêt des Pietro. Et l'autre tire. L'arrêt du gardien. Et malheureusement, Gignac. So, I mean. Even when he was playing in Windsor in the OHL and he got drafted by Vancouver and so on, we always knew that this goaltender was athletic, good, good uh, reflexes, um, a gamer, you know, uh, somebody that could possibly rise through the ranks um, to get to the NHL. But things have been tough, uh, a tough path for this goaltender. I know we mentioned it. 
Um, I think I mentioned it on the Black and Gold Hockey podcast, which I highly you know recommend you guys subscribe and follow and love. Uh, but um, I think that what Vancouver did to him, uh, did to him was kind of you know a step back in in his development by using him as the third goal t- goaltender in the in the COVID years uh, while the NHL Vancouver Canucks were playing. So. Um, I think he could have been playing somewhere, uh, whether it be in Abbotsford at the time um, or not. But uh, he, he was traded to Boston in the Jackson Nika trade and worked his way up from Maine. You know, when he came here, the first started in the uh, ECHL with the Maine Mariners, played really well. There was an injury. I'm not sure to who in the in the Providence Bruins. I want to say it was Kyle Kaiser at the time. And DPH role worked his way into the spot naturally because it was an injury, but also proved to the Providence Bruins that, you know, we can't just get this guy down, you know, and, and unfortunately Kaiser couldn't go the rest of the year or very spotty starts here and there while he was recovering. But Michael DPH really, you know, took hold of his opportunity last year along with Brandon Bussey, those two were pretty much, uh, they were in the ranks, not the top rank, but they were in the higher echelon of the league. And, and when you're concerned, when you're talking about tandems and so on. So I like what, I like what Di Pietro has offered. I think his game has stepped up tremendously. Um, I think he's been working a lot with uh, Mike Dunham um, and Mike Dunham's the goalie coach for the Boston Bruins that does travel around to see all these prospects and make sure that they're eating good, they're training good, you know, giving tips and advice and so on. Something that, you know, a former goaltender, but a, a goaltender, you know, uh, consultant would do. Um, so I, I just like his game. I like where it's going. Uh, I, I just, it's so hard for me to like really gauge his NHL, what he, what he could do with the nhl because we just haven't seen it and i'm not sure if it's going to be seen in boston with the 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 landscape in front of him with um jeremy swayman locked up for seven more years um you know what's going to happen with uh unico pasalo who's been playing very well and we all thought well i thought at least that kupasalo could be the 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 goaltender that goes down to Providence and starts the year and have Brandon Bussey up and, you know, kind of give him the role because that's where it seemed like it was going before the Allmark trade. Um, but I like Michael. I think he's doing a fantastic job. He's square to the puck. His reflexes are really good for that. Like you said, the undersized netminder that a lot of teams shy away from, you know, they want the six, six, the six, seven freaking goaltender and so on. But this guy's just proven a lot of those guys wrong. All right, and uh, on the other side, we talked so well about Michael DiPietro. Now we unfortunately got to talk about Brandon Bussey and 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 his rough start to the season. Um, why don't you start off with your thoughts? And do you think Brandon Bussey can snap out of this funk that he's currently in? Well, first, I just want to say, like, this is what I like so much about this this podcast. It's just it's two fans. Like, if you let us go on like this will be a five hour podcast. So, you know, I'm never going to be like, oh, stop, stop. I Like, I love hearing it, especially something like the Providence Bruins, where it's where it's tougher to find fans like that. But uh, I said it a few times. He, he has zero wins this season, four losses, four point one one goals against average and an eight fifty save percentage. I just think he's too talented for for these stats to stick and stay. But the the more that we're watching these games, the more that they actually are staying. And it's it's unfortunate because, like you, I thought that this was going to be a really good trip for Providence as a whole. And but I also thought it was going to be a great opportunity for Bussy to get a win. And and it's tough because like goalies, it's the most thankless job in sports. When you win, like like Di Pietro on Wednesday. You, it's thankless. They don't care. But when you lose, you're the problem. But um, when you watch a few of these games, the stats don't always tell the, the full story. There's certainly a few goals that uh, that you want him to, to have, especially this last game in Laval. But there's also a ton of saves that he's made where he's a completely bailed out his team. And sometimes uh, it's in the 2 nothing games. And sometimes it's in the 6-3 games that he's making these saves. So it's 
it's difficult. You want him to come up with these saves, but like I said, I just think he's just he's too talented to to stay at this bottom ten level. He's not a bottom ten goalie, and I just we talked about that sulking period. This guy, I think me and you, we see a lot of a lot of the things alike. Like I I thought that Bussy had a real shot at being that number one in Boston before Swayman signed, and now three weeks into the season, he's he's bottom ten in the AHL. So it's just it's so tough because it's, it's clearly a mental thing at this point. And like I said, for a third time now, he's just too talented to stay at this bottom level. And when you talked about DiPietro playing in the ECHL and he dominated, I think he had like a, a 950 save percentage. I don't know. Maybe that's an option for Bussy, but I want him to stay in the AHL. And, you know, I said it last week with the power play. Like, I think he just needs one to get to get going. I think he just needs one win. He needs to have one good outing where where Providence plays well in front of him. Because unfortunately, the games that he has played well, like the game uh, in against Hershey, they didn't play well. And he he played a really good game and he kept him in it, but they just weren't able to score goals. And that's a backbreaker because then you look at the stats and it's just it's it's ugly. But like I said, this last game in Laval was was not his finest, but I'm sure he can come back. They're they're playing Bridgeport and they're playing Hartford this week. I don't. I'm assuming he's going to start one of these games, not two, because DiPietro's just been unreal so far. But if he gets to play against Bridgeport, I think this is a team that uh, I think this is a game that that Bussy can control himself, regardless of how Providence plays in front of him. And Hartford's going to be a little bit more difficult. That team's a lot more skilled. But uh, I think even if he starts against Hartford, it's he still has a good chance of winning any game, even against Laval, even against Charlotte. Any any team, I think he has a good chance going in. It's just, can he put it all together? Yeah. Yeah, let's uh, check out this highlight of Brandon Bussey uh, against Laval, which is a good one. And uh, I'll talk about uh, Brandon on the other side. Il récupérer pour Roy, du haut du cercle, la remise à Gignac, transversale, tire, quel arrêt de Bossy, il vient voler Owen Beck, c'est Roy qui reprend au cercle gauche ensuite, près du filet, compte de temps dans l'entlant, bel arrêt de Bossy, la jambe. So in, in that play, you could just see how big he is and, and, and how square he is to the puck, but I like what you were talking about earlier, it's like, you know, you look at the score and it's like six to three, and he might have given up a, a you know, a pretty controversial goal that he, he you know all goaltenders want to get, have back but it's also the way he plays in those games when his when his team is seemingly out of it and those are good things that you want to see a lot of goaltenders and even right forwards and defensemen to develop that that skill that the world's not going to end it's not over i can still try to compete and contribute to to our success and I think that that's one of the stronger traits that Brandon Bussey has in his worth ethnic that even though there are bad times uh there's there's ways out of it so I like that I still think that Brandon's highly regarded in the in the Boston Bruins organization I know the coaching staff absolutely loves him um but he's just got to get out of this funk uh, out of his head and start putting a string of games together unfortunately the way Michael DiPietro is playing right now He's pretty much stealing the the uh, the Friday Sunday games. If there was a three and three on a weekend, like Brandon did years back when he was primarily the Friday Sunday guy. So now it's Brandon is this is the Saturday guy, the middleman on a on a three game schedule on a Friday to um, uh, to Sunday stretch. So now he's got to work his way back, snap out of it, work his way back to try to battle for that that seemingly starting goaltender which i still don't believe is ever a real thing in the american hockey league because trust me when you play through a majority of the season is uh, is friday through sunday and not i don't think any goalies in the league play all three games so when you play a schedule like that when you when you even everything out after 72 there's probably a goalie that has three more starts in that series. So it's pretty much even. It's a 1A, 1B, uh, in my opinion. I know that everybody else has their own opinions and so on, but I just don't believe that there's a definitive starting goal 10 in the American Hockey League. Yeah, and, and we talked about it last week. Hunter Shepard and, and Clay Stevenson, they were number one and number two statistically last season, and that's why they're back-to-back -back champions because you, you need two very strong goalies, and I believe Providence has that. 
and I don't hate, I don't hate this position that he's in right now. It's not a bad thing to be starting one game out of the three. I think that's, that's where he might want to be. Just focus on that one game and just try to take it down one game at a time instead of trying to swallow two games in a, in a weekend. But uh, yeah. And, and you said he's highly regarded and he's, he's certainly earned that he's earned that position to be highly regarded. And I think everybody in the system knows that this is just a funk. He, he is still a talented goaltender and he could be huge for, for Boston, the Boston organization going forward. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's move on to the next topic and kind of wrap this up. Um, Providence Bruins forward Vinny Letary, second tour of duty here for the Providence Bruins. And one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this topic up is because the other night, Jacob Lauko got into a fight with the Minnesota Wild against somebody else. And a lot of fans saw that and said, you know, really wish the Bruins never traded that guy. And I understand Jacob Loco was a very popular player here in Boston and Providence, but he, he was a contract year. And I know he wasn't going to be making four or $5 million. He was probably going to get a million or two bump uh, from Boston if he was going to stay. But here's my thing. I'm trying to tell the fans out there that are, that are frustrated because Sweeney was stupid. He should have never gotten this guy. You traded a legitimate NHL player for an American Hockey League player. But that's not how I see it. And I know that no nobody sees things my way all the time. But if if Jacob Lauko was resigned, that's less money that you would have to put towards anybody that you're, you know, trying to lock up over this past offseason. Particularly Jeremy Swayman. You needed that cap flexibility. Um, you know, uh, and, and to sign some of these guys like Lynn Holman and Zadorov. So you need to maximize your salary cap space to get these players. So unfortunately, he was a casualty to their plans. But what they did get back was a guy and a player in Vinny Letary, a, a solid veteran who has had experience in this system and thrived in this system. When he his first year, he was a goal scoring machine working alongside Fabian Lysel and Georgia Mikulov. Mikulov on the left, Lysel on the right, one of the best lines in the American Hockey League until Letary got called up. And then in that first practice at Warrior Ice Arena, um, did something to his ankle and was injured. So with Letary now out, Mikulov switched over to the middle. And then I believe uh, Richard came up and played. Uh, uh, maybe I'm just totally off on that. But regardless, Letary was is a good, like veteran for the younger players. He works. He he's got speed. He's got skill. And I think that he worked very well with uh, with Mikulov and Lysel. And I kind of think that that's what the Boston Bruins wanted back was to have a mentor like him back in the fold, back in the system, because if Mikulov and Lysel don't succeed, which they didn't do, they didn't really show it much at all. I mean, Lysel did, Mikulov not so much in my opinion, but they didn't really show a lot of, you know, securing a uh, an NHL roster spot to start the year. So by that, them going down to Providence, now you have somebody down there to keep your spirits up. You have that veteran leader that you can lean on for advice and so on. And it's never a bad thing to have an extension to Ryan Musinell's bench. You know, you already have Matt Thomas on as a, as an assistant coach. You have Trent Whitfield on as an assistant coach. You have um, uh, Patrick Brown and so on. But you also need others to fulfill the, the needs of some of the younger players that need advice, you know, and, and I like, I like, I like having Letary back, but what it also did was, it was a very shrewd move that we talked about last, last week, I believe with Elliot Groenwald, they traded Lauko to get that pick that Groenwald was selected at and Letary. So it was a very good move because you've got the defenseman right around or, or projected a little higher than you picked with the trade, but you also brought back a veteran that, yes, he's going to be playing in the American Hockey League, but he also had a chance to fight for an NHL spot in training camp. So uh, a little bit long-winded right there, but what are your thoughts on Vinny Letary and his secondary duty coming back to Providence? 
I think that the fans that don't like the deal are very close minded. I think that Lauco is a great player and I and I had I, I enjoyed watching him, but Letary played most of the season last year up in Minnesota and Lauco's doing that right now. But I even if Lauco was still here, he'd probably be in the minors anyways. And I don't understand how people are, are watching Letary right now just play at an NHL level at the AHL level and say like we shouldn't have traded him, especially when we got that pick. Now, obviously, I'm very biased because I like the pick of Elliot Gronwald, but Vinny Letary is also having a fantastic season, and he has something that I think the the Bruins are sorely lacking right now in Providence, and it's it's confidence. He leads the team in shots. He'll take a shot from anywhere, and funny enough, they go in, and it's just it's something I want to see more. Uh, I want to see more out of the lineup. I want to see shots on that. And I mean, this guy's wrist shot is unbelievable. I mean, it anywhere on the ice, if you go through all the highlights, this guy shoots it from literally anywhere and they go in, regardless of if the goalie's ready or if the goalie's set to the shot, it doesn't matter. He's just that good. And and I like the trade, but uh, I could also see the other side. But, you know, Lauco's not doing, you know, what Letary was doing last season. I, I don't believe like, I, or actually, I, I think they're doing more, more of the same where it's kind of like, they're not in the lineup every night, but Letary now playing in the minors, like you said, being a mentor, I think it's just, it's huge, especially with how well he's playing as well. I just don't understand how people would be upset by the move, especially getting Letary back. It's not like he's a new player. He's coming back. He was a fan favorite and then he left and now he's a fan favorite again. So you're kind of trading one fan favorite for another one in my eyes. So I really like the move and, uh, and I like the, the move of getting Elliot Gronwald as well. Yeah. Well said. All right, let's move on to uh, the upcoming games. Uh, wrap up the show a little bit on Friday night. Um, the Providence Bruins are at the Amica Mutual Pavilion to face the Atlantic Division rival Bridgeport Islanders. The Islanders currently sit in the last place in the Atlantic uh, with a two six and one record, six points. Um, and they are on a losing streak, and they are two six one and one in their last ten. So um, this should be a layup, in my opinion. You know, I, I mean, Providence is not <laughs> really that much better. Um, they have a three in nine games. They have a three six and zero record with six points, and they are currently on a two game losing streak themselves. Three six and zero in the last ten. So. Um, and the Providence needs to score more because they've given up 19. I'm uh, sorry. They've scored 19 goals, but given up 25, which is not a good stat in my opinion. Um, so what, what are your thoughts on, on this game, uh, Kenny? And can they pull out this two, two points? And it's Friday night. I mean, is this a game that you roll with your hot hand with Michael DiPietro, or is this a game that you look to Brandon Bussey to get his confidence back up? Uh, I think that this is matchup wise. I think this is really, really good game for Providence. I think Providence is way more talented than this team. And uh, Bridgeport's having a little bit of goalie trouble uh, of their own as Marcus Hogberg got injured last Wednesday against Wilkes-Barre. And today, a, a deflating loss, I will say, a 10.30 school day game for Bridgeport when they took on okay. uh, Springfield. They were up 3 nothing in the first period and ended up losing 5 nothing or 5-3. Uh, they gave up five unanswered goals. Uh, you know, it's difficult because I want Bussy to get this first win so that we can get both goalies rolling. But I also want to have a really strong start to this weekend. I don't want to lose one game and then have to worry about the other two. But like I said, something that is that scares me about this Bridgeport team is they're not very good at what Providence isn't very good at, but they're really good at what Providence isn't good at. They lead the league in shorthanded goals. Providence, the last few games, have been struggling on the power play just because I feel like there's no urgency when they're trying to regroup and teams have taken advantage of that and they've and they've kind of rushed them. And they've created turnovers and scored goals. And Brian Pino of the Bridgeport Islanders has three shorthanded goals. And when you watch this team, as I as I have this season, they create so much because they take advantage of teams like Providence, who 
kind of are sluggish getting back, kind of not sulking, but they're, they're, they're kind of taking their time and stuff like that. And they take advantage of that by usually when you see a one-on-one -on -one with a guy kind of taking his time, trying to kill down that clock, they have two guys going as fast as they can down the ice and scoring goals. So it's something that Providence needs to watch out for this, uh, this weekend. But other than that, I think Providence just completely outmatches this team. And even though they haven't showed it so far this season, they're just so much more skilled. Yeah. Uh, on Saturday night, they are away to play the same team, the uh, Bridgeport Islanders. Uh, we, we're not going to regurgitate what we just said about these, this matchup on Friday night. So it pretty much remains the same for Saturday. Just hope that they can, um, you know, have a good road game. Uh, I don't have the standings up right now that show the road, uh, the home and away records. But um, I think that Providence does have a, I think, decent road record. They could, they could be one and one. I'm not sure. But that's not decent, to be honest with you. Um, and then to wrap up the three and three weekend, it's Sunday afternoon at home against the Hartford Wolfpack. Um, these two teams constantly do battle against each other. Uh, over the years, Th this is probably one of the the true arrivals in the Atlantic Division between Hartford and Providence. But uh, Hartford's in the fourth position after nine games played. They have a four three one and one record, uh, ten points, which is five points behind leading Hershey Bears. Um, and they are not on a winning streak right now, but they are four three one and one in the last ten. So this is probably going to be a very big test. Uh, for the Providence Bruins. Thoughts on the game against the Hartford Wolfpack? Yeah, Hartford and Providence are two teams that are always in it at the end. They are two very storied teams. Hartford's kind of had a slower start than they would probably hope for. Obviously not as slow as Providence has had. But I think when you're as skilled as Providence, you can go into any building any night and, and take it. And I think that this is going to be uh, more of a test because it's going to be their third game and their first three and three of the season. So I just want to see how they play. I'm not going to, I'm not going to put too much into it if they lose, but if they win, this is going to be huge for the confidence going forward, going into the next week. So I hope that they can get this win. The goaltending for uh, Hartford has been a little, a little shaky. So hopefully they can get some shots and finally score some goals. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, and questions, we don't have any in this particular segment because we did have one from our company Carly, Tom Caliuti, talking about Michael DPHRO, the goaltender, and how he's been doing uh, as the best, as the better goaltender in, um, in the Boston Bruins affiliate. Um, so that's pretty much it for, for this week. Um, a little short and sweet. Uh, I know we want to try to get it to 45 minutes to an hour, but last time I think we were talking for an hour and 45 minutes. Now we get it to uh, 110. Maybe we're next trending week in the right finally. direction. We're we are. Right we are. Direction. I think. I think we. I think we're getting better too. Um, you know, this is a work in progress program, so uh, please, hopefully, stay with us. Uh, things are definitely going to get better um, as we get structure down and so on, because this is new for me. I haven't been a, a main host of a program in a couple of years, so. This is uh, it's like getting back on the bicycle again, trying yeah, to yeah. trying to figure things out. But uh, uh, I appreciate everybody that listens. We appreciate the downloads. Please uh, subscribe and hit the hit the thumbs up button and the notifications bell. So when we do drop a new Providence Hockey Report podcast, you'll be notified. Um, I do want to shout out Flow Hockey for allowing us to uh, use their their. Uh, audio and video content, please go to flowhockey.com and get yourself a subscription if you're a hockey fan uh, because there's so much stuff that you can watch. Uh, I love watching the BCHL. I love watching the AJHL late at night. You know, is always some good hockey on uh, and it's definitely worth the price. So um, please uh, subscribe if you're, if you're an audio listener on Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and any of those um, those uh, platforms that allow feedback, uh, please give us a five star rating and please write a review. Um, you know, let us know what you want to hear. This show is basically for you. So, I mean, it's just it's just Kenny and I talking on every week, but we want to cater to what you guys want to hear. So, uh, let us know in a in a rating. 
Um, obviously, we'll we'll read those ratings, and if it's five stars, we'll definitely check it out. And and if you have some feedback, we'll we'll read it off, and we'll try to do what we can for our for our favorite um, you know, listeners and viewers. So, um, Kenny, I think that's uh, pretty much it. What do you think? Yeah, definitely better than the first week for me personally. A lot more comfortable, and as we we keep making more i'm sure we're gonna get way more comfortable and it's gonna be like the black and gold pod is just gonna rifle it off keep going that's right that's right yeah and um if you want to know more about like like so we have the black and gold hockey podcast that covers the nhl level we have the providence hockey report podcast which is this one which is the ahl level and if you want to hear what goes on at the echl level of the bruins double a minor pro affiliate check out our friend ben Kennedy and his main hockey report podcast uh, follow uh, him and his program at Mariners hockey report one. Um, and he does a great job over there. Um, uh, you know, getting everybody up to date on what's going on up in Portland, Maine. We do have a new pro uh, Portland, Maine. Sorry. We do have a new Mariners uh, hockey writer that's coming on the website. His name is Chris. Um, I don't remember his last name, <laughs> but anyway, Chris will be joining us pretty soon, uh, and he'll be uh, writing the text on the uh, on the uh, on the website to let us know what everything is going on up in Portland with transactions and news and scores and so on. So we got a lot of things coming at you for the rest of the season. So hopefully you'll follow us, follow along, subscribe, and and do all that good stuff because it really helps us helps us uh, along. So. That being said, I'm your host, Mark Allred. Please follow me at Black and Gold 277 on Twitter slash X. That is Mr. Kenny Kaminsky. Please follow him on Twitter slash X at Kenny Kaminsky. This is the Providence Bruins Hockey Report, and we'll talk to you guys next week.